Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 4319 in the name of Graeme Simpson on ferry problems. I would invite all those members who wish to speak in the debate. Please press the request to speak button side. I call on Graeme Simpson to speak to and to move the motion up to seven minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We wanted to call this debate Ferries Fiasco, but parliamentary staff told us we couldn't. So it may not be called Ferries Fiasco in the bulletin, but that's what it is. Yeah. And, uh, and I move the motion in what should be called the Ferries Fiasco debate in my name. We used our last debating time to debate ferries. Had anything changed since then, we could have gone on something else. But we still don't know why the SNP awarded the contract to build ferries 801 and 802 to FMEL against the advice of their in-house experts, despite hundreds of documents being posted by the Scottish Government. We've had the very sad sight of that UK forces hero, Keith Brown, beating a hasty retreat from Her Majesty's press the other week, <laughs> sidestepping their battle lines to slink <laughs> into the cover of the canteen. <laughs> Mr Brown did give a less than satisfactory interview with Channel 4 later, in which he said this, that document, the one that signed it off, if it ever existed, is not now available. <laughs> but it was quite clear from associated documents that it was approved and approved by the Minister for Transport. Work that one out. A document that signed off the decision, if it ever existed. Perhaps the Minister can tell us now whether the document referred to by Mr Brown existed or not. Well, the, sil the silence speaks volumes, presiding officer. Mr Brown, of course, uh, remembered the script by the end of his sentence and again blamed Derek Mackay, who, at the time of the decision, was then the lowly Minister for Transport, with Mr Brown as his boss. The idea that Derek wouldn't talk to Keith, who wouldn't talk to John, who signed the cheques, who wouldn't, wouldn't run it past Nicola, is preposterous, particularly when they had an announcement to make at the SNP conference. Derek, Keith, John and Nicola, the Ferries Four, a very dodgy group with no hits to their name. <laughs> There is a real and enduring stench of cover-up here. The secrecy of the SNP is appalling and it's corrupt. We don't know why the Yard got the contract, but it did. Nicola Sturgeon says, we saved the jobs at the Yard. But that Yard could have continued if it had not been given that ill-fated contract. There's no reason, there is no reason to think otherwise. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forrest. Does the member know of any business that would exist without work being given to it? Graeme Simpson. The yard, had, the yard had work. The yard had work. That is a fact. I believe, and Jim McCall believes, that it could have continued. You could be pretty certain that the yard won't take on anything on this scale again, whatever the future holds. And we don't know what the future holds for the Yard because the government can't make its mind up. Presiding officer, the debate... Well, I'll take a, I'll, I will take an intervention from Mr McKee because he never gives us any answers to questions. Minister Ivan McKee. Oh, and, indeed I do, as the member knows fine well. If, if the member is so sure that there was work in the Yard, can you please specify what that work was? There was, work at, there was work at the Yard. Was work at the Yard. There was work at the Yard. Uh, they had work and they could, they could, have, take, they could have taken on more work. Now, presiding officer, presiding officer, the debate has moved on a little since we last discussed this in Parliament. I've got to be fair about this. We've discovered, for instance, that the FML deal may have breached European state aid rules because the government didn't tell the EU about a £106 million incentive to ensure the work went to Ferguson's. And we know, we know that figures like the hugely respected Jim Sillers as well as former First Minister Jack McConnell, believe the failure to come clean on the decision-making process may have broken the law on several fronts. We also know that only one in five Scots think the SNP are doing a good job of running ferry services. Well, those people need to get out more if they think that, because most don't share that view. There's another thing we've discovered too. Stuart Hosey thinks ferries 801 and 802 are a little late. 
and that money has not been wasted. Well, five years and more than two and a half times over budget sounds more than a little late, and it certainly sounds like waste to me. It's that sort of attitude, it's, it's that, sort of attitude that has got us where we are. I won't take any more interventions. It's little wonder that the good people of Arran elected a Conservative councillor, Timothy Billings, last week. Islanders, like those on Arran, are the most important people in all this. They're the ones that can't get to hospital, can't get to work, can't get deliveries, can't see family and friends, or can't get to school in some cases, and all because we have an ageing and unreliable fleet on the West Coast with no clear plan on renewing vessels. It doesn't matter to Islanders who runs the ferries or where they're built, they just want them to be there. Our motion mentions the 15 stage page payments that were agreed for each vessel. It could actually be more than that. It also talks about the lack of engagement with the experienced workforce. Edward Mountain will have much more to say about that. Presiding officer, I've been calling for the Transport Minister to release the Project Neptune report. We're led to believe this will set out options for how we might uh, procure and run ferries. Jenny Ruth said she couldn't release it during the Council election campaign. Well, that reason doesn't exist now, so she should publish it this week. And only then can we start to have a sensible conversation on this, because that's what we need to have. We should not get bogged down in ideology. We should listen to the voice of islanders like the Mull and Iona Ferry Committee. They've been making some very good points about vessel design and how we should look at potentially breaking up the West Coast contract into smaller chunks, which is not, as some believe, privatisation. Uh, Presiding officer, we will support the Labour amendment today in the name of my good friend Neil Bibby. Unfortunately, the amendment in the name of my other very good friend Jenny Gilruth is, I'm afraid, devoid of hope. <laughs> and we can't support it. She should speak to me next time and I can send her some of my positivity because that is what the islanders of Scotland are looking out for, and it's not what they're getting. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call on Jenny Ruth, Minister, to speak to and move Amendment 4319.2. Up to six minutes, please, Minister. Well, Presiding Officer, talking to that positivity that Mr Simpson was seeking, I have some good news to share with Parliament. And indeed, Presiding Officer, I have that good news literally here in my hand. The missing document has been found. Ministers... Ministers were advised of this by officials shortly before noon today, and I wanted to take the first available opportunity to give Parliament this news. The document is an email that makes clear who approved the decision to award the contract to build vessels 801 and 802 to Ferguson shipyard. Sent in response to the key submission on the 8th of October 2015, it is dated 9th of October at 14.32, and it reads... The Minister is content with the proposals and would like them to be moved on as quickly as possible, please. Presiding Officer, the email was sent by the Office of the Minister of Transport and Islands. Presiding Officer, I hold in my hand that irrefutable documentary evidence that this decision was made rightly and properly by the then Transport Minister, Derek Mackay. Now, I'd like to make some progress. Now, we said we would continue to look in good faith, and we have. That is exactly what we have done. It was found because a copy of an email chain had been retained by someone in the Scottish Government Finance Department because the then Finance Secretary was briefed on the decision. Now, by chance, a copy of that email chain between two officials who left government some years ago includes the email from the Transport Minister's private office and was buried in someone's electronic files. Now, the email confirms what we said it would say. It is basically one line long because that is how the system of government works. Absolutely. Now, Presiding Officer, this documentary, documentation has been provided to the Auditor-General and is now being published, and as I speak, uh, alongside all the other documents that we have already published relating to this matter on the Government's website, I'd like to make some progress. But this email destroys the opposition's ridiculous conspiracy Absolutely. theories that another minister made this decision, and it destroys their unfounded speculation that there was a ministerial direction given. Presiding Officer... I do welcome this opportunity to discuss ferry issues again today. Our ferry network, I will. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. 
So what, what the uh, email just read out does not say is why the decision was taken and why the advice not to, not to award that contract was ignored, nor does, it, nor does it say whether there were discussions between Mr Mackay and Mr Brown and Mr Swinney and Ms Sturgeon, does it? Minister. The decision to award the contract the information that pertains to this that Mr Simpson is searching for has already been published. Absolutely. He has had answers to numerous topical questions. The First Minister has answered numerous questions on this issue. The opposition have to give up. They have an answer here today. You have an answer here today. Do you know, Presiding Officer, if the opposition... If the opposition don't take my word for it, they need to listen to the words in the voters on our island communities. They're the ones who want to see progress on this. They're the ones who deserve a solution. Now, our ferry network, as we all know, is as intrinsic to those who live on our mainland as roads might be to the rest of us. They are islanders' motorways, as I was told recently by the Shetland Hauliers Association. And the government has got to get improving, uh, get, got to get to rather improving how we deliver ferry services, and we have to do that correctly. Now, Mr. Simpson, Mr. Simpson knows. Yes, I will. Alice Rowland. I thank the minister for giving way uh, and welcome the fact that uh, we're, we're now, I think, turning to the subject of ferries away from the conspiracy theories we've listened to for the last few minutes from the opposition. As the minister will appreciate, Calmac have, within the past hour. Uh, announced that uh, MV Lord of the Isles will be out of service from this Tuesday for an estimated eight days due to a technical issue. This leaves Loch Boisdale once again without a service to the mainland for a prolonged period of time, uh, adding to the already... Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Dr Allen, please resume your seat. Dr Allen is trying to make an intervention. There's too much noise. Please let Dr Allen make the intervention. Dr Allen. Thank you. Um, uh, as the Minister will be aware, uh, this is not the first uh, period of time when uh, Loch Boisdale has been without a service, and she does, I know, from conversations with her, appreciate the frustration caused. So will she commit now to raising this with CalMAC as a matter of urgency, with a view to establishing an improvement plan specifically for Malig to help with uh, dealing with and, the, and Dr Allen, uh, it should be a brief intervention. I think the Minister probably has the gist in order to respond to that. I thank Mr Allen for his intervention. I, I became aware of the issues surrounding the Lord of the Isles vessel uh, earlier today. I will be meeting with Calmac later on tonight, who I believe are attending the parliamentary reception, raising it with them directly. And I want to come on now to discuss some of the issues we faced more recently on the Isle of Arran and how those were resolved productively by Calmac. I think it is important now, presiding officer, that we do move on. We owe it all to our island communities to do better on the debate on ferries. We've got to lift the tone. And I was really reminded of this on a call last week with the Iron Ferry Committee, where we reflected on some of the lessons learned from their recent outage with the MV Cali Isles. And Sheila Gilmore, who is the Chief Executive of Visit Arran, has spoken of the reputational damage that the outage caused and indeed some news reports that the weekend the outage began incorrectly reported that all routes to Arran were off. I think we all, irrespective of party in the chamber, must support the return of tourism to our island communities, which, of course, in 2022 will be absolutely vital to many businesses and to families. Presiding officer, cognizant of time, I've already today been absolutely clear that communities are not currently always getting the service they need. That needs to change, but I would suggest they don't need the opposition's very own version of Groundhog Day either. What our island communities need is accurate, fair and well-informed commentary and debate about the challenges, but also, I think, the opportunities for their economies and communities. Ferries and resilient transport connectivity is absolutely key to ensuring Scotland's islands thrive and flourish. And I'm determined all that I can do to make that happen. And everyone in the Scottish Government is determined to make that happen additionally. I hope the opposition will join me in that endeavour. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Neil Bibby to speak to and move Amendment 4319.1. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I welcome the debate brought forward by Graeme Simpson this afternoon. Uh, today, Scottish Labour are making a further call for full openness and transparency to get to the bottom of Scotland's ferry fiasco. A parliamentary committee has already branded the procurement of vessels 801 and 802 as a catastrophic Failure. Audit Scotland outlined a multitude of failings leading to delays of four years and a procurement budget that is now two and a half times the original contract price. And we still do not have clear answers about what went wrong and, crucially, why. This is not acceptable. If the concerns of the workforce at Ferguson's had been addressed sooner, then perhaps the yard would be in a better position now. Just to, let me make some progress, please. And one of the biggest failures in public procurement of the past 20 years could have been avoided. 
There are conflicting accounts about how we ended up where we are today. The First Minister rightly asks us to treat the accounts of Jim McCall and the previous owners with caution. They are not, as she said in the Chamber, an uninterested party. That is correct. But neither is the Scottish Government. These are ferries procured on their behalf by seamail. As I have said repeatedly, the First Minister is ultimately responsible for the Scottish Government. We believe she should assume direct ministerial responsibility for the Government's investments at Ferguson's, for putting this yard on a stronger footing and for assuring full transparency about all that has got wrong. Audit Scotland said there was insufficient documentary evidence to explain why the contract for these ferries was issued without a full refund guarantee. This remains astonishing and clearly requires further investigation. The Minister quotes an email uh, today that nobody in this chamber has, has seen before now, and we still do not know. Well, the fact that the Minister has not seen uh, it before today, uh, uh, should officer, be sedentary conversation because it is not necessarily picked up in the, the official fact, report, Mr. Baby. The fact that the Transport Minister is only unearthing emails today about this ferry fiasco begs the question what else is there that the Scottish Government has not actually found in the archives? Because what we need to know, crucially, is why the Scottish Government ignored the advice of CMAL, and there is no documentary evidence. Audit Scotland have said that, and this Parliament has still not seen any documentary evidence that actually proves why the Scottish Government ignored the advice of CMAL. On the issue of fullness and openness and transparency, a number of senior staff at Ferguson's Yard signed non-disclosure agreements. I note the First Minister's remarks at First Minister's questions, so let me say clearly that non-disclosure requirements should not prevent anyone from giving full and accurate evidence to Audit Scotland, but also to anybody legitimately investigating the failures of Ferguson's or to this Parliament. This is the purpose, yeah, and I would welcome confirmation from the, the Cabinet Secretary whether she will support Labour's amendment for, for those non-disclosure agreements to be waived. Will you be supporting our amendment? Cabinet Secretary. I'd be quite keen to know whether Labour actually supports the workers at Ferguson's, because the GMB has yeah. absolutely yeah. blasted Labour for using Ferguson's workers as a political football, eroding morale, undermining efforts to save the yard on a long-term basis. Mm. Is the member proud of his efforts in that regard? Neil Bibby. I, I, respect, I respect what the GMB have to say. I would always expect the GMB to stand up for their members. Stuart McMillan, the local MSP, has said that the workforce at Ferguson's are embarrassed. They should not be embarrassed. They are blameless in this. The people that should be embarrassed is the Scottish Government who have overseen this fiasco. And on the issue of the GMB, the Scottish Government can't selectively uh, quote about what the GMB say and, and does on particular issues. The Union, as well as Scottish Labour, have made, continuously made constructive suggestions about building simpler ferries. Um, and that's fallen on deaf ears. We've made constructive suggestions on building those ferries in Scotland and not in Turkey to protect Scottish building jobs, and that's something that has fallen on deaf ears uh, as well. Uh, the purpose of our amendment today, um, and I hope it's something that every member in the chamber will support, and uh, we'll, we'll wait and see what the government are going to do on it, um, is vital to ensure that all non-disclosure agreements relating to the procurement of these ferries are waived. Non-disclosure agreements should not prevent anyone from making legitimate inquiries. We need openness and transparency. We cannot afford secrecy and cover-up. So a vote for our amendment is a vote for openness and transparency, and a vote against would be a vote for secrecy and cover-up. officer, the scrutiny of decisions taken over the past several years is necessary and unavoidable. A catastrophic failure in procurement of this kind must not happen again. Lessons need to be learned. Let me be clear again, the skilled workers at Ferguson's are not to blame for these delays. The damage this government has done to the reputation of the yard damages the potential of Scottish shipbuilding, not the legitimate inquiries of auditors and of this parliament. We owe it to the workforce to turn this around, get new contracts into the yard and get this sector of the economy firing on all cylinders again. I represent the Lower Clyde, I represent many of the workers, I stand behind all of those who want to breathe new life into this industry. That is why I am again calling for a national ferry building replacement programme that supports the sector. Scottish Labour's ambition is to modernise the Calmac fleet. New ferries with the Lower Clyde building its fair share will bring resilience to our ferry network and create new opportunities for the workforce. Those ferries do not need to be complex, new designs like the dual fuel ferries at Ferguson's now. Simpler contracts for simpler ferries do not need to go overseas to places like Turkey. We can create a pipeline of work that will see the Lower Clyde getting its fair share. 
It just takes leadership from this Mr. government. Mr Bibby, you'll need to bring your remarks to okay. close, please. President officer, there must be openness and transparency. That also applies to the Project Neptune report. That must be published without delay. Uh, I reiterate that the CalMac network must be retained as a public service in the interests of the travelling public. There must be full disclosure. Mr Bibby, please move the amendment. Okay, name uh, to turn this year, I move the amendment in my name. Thank, Thank you, Mr Bibby. I now call on Willie Rennie. Up to four minutes, please. Um, the Minister obviously thinks that she has demolished all the arguments, but I have to say her revelation today, I would expect it to believe that she had just discovered the email this morning for a start, which is very, very difficult to believe, bearing in mind the track record of this government on openness. But she is expecting us to believe that a multi-million pound contract was given the go-ahead on the basis of a one-line email. For me, that doesn't fill me with confidence. Certainly, it doesn't explain why the central advice was ignored by the Minister. And you would have expected for a multi-million pound contract for that to have been set out why that advice had been... Not just now, I'm going to try and explain my argument. Why that advice was ignored. But also, it shows a government that is very poor at keeping records for something that is such a multi-million pound contract, also costing lots of money, but in addition to that, where islanders, as we now know, are dependent on the success of those contracts. So I don't think it fills this chamber with confidence, as you can hear from the laughter at the Minister's claims this afternoon. But I think it will raise an awful lot more questions, and I want to see this email. I want to see the background to the email, and I want to see the paperwork that goes with it. Because I simply do not believe that at the last minute, before it just happens to be before a debate, we have a slam dunk argument from the minister. And there is an element, I have to say now, of comical alley about the SNP and their approach to this, as the bombs are raining down around them. The denial continues. And we heard that from Stuart Hosey yesterday, as Graeme Simpson has already set out, that it's a little bit late. Four years and longer, we are certain. That it's not waste of £150 million. £150 million over budget. Tell that to the islanders who are waiting yet again when their ferries have broken down on multiple islands. Tell that to the families freezing at home because they can't afford to pay their electricity bill. If they put £10 million into the fuel insecurity fund, £10 million. Just imagine how much of a difference we could make if we added another £150 million into that fuel insecurity budget. But for the SNP, it doesn't matter. It's not waste. And it's a little bit late. So they need to accept that they have made some fundamental errors with this, and it's having a direct impact on people's lives right now. Rather than keeping on the denial and revealing emails at the last minute before debates, that's not the way to run a government, and it's a sign of a government that's getting increasingly arrogant in its approach to administration. And we do need another debate, because Graeme Simpson was right, he's had debates before, and we've had a debate in this chamber too. And we've still not got those critical answers, including on the Project Neptune. But the most important thing for me is the way that this government, this government has tra trashed the reputation of a very good yard that has now meant that it's not even bidding for ferry contracts that are going off to Turkey instead. Don't blame anyone else. Don't blame the opposition for the reputation being trashed, because the responsibility is held on those front benches and all the back benches behind them who back them every single day. The reputation has been trashed, just like Bifab, just like the £10 billion China deal, just like Loch Aber, just like Tata and the Lanarkshire steel mills, where the, the state aid rules have not... I'm running yeah, out of time. The member's about to close. So the reputation has been trashed by this government. Do not dare blame anyone else for that. The responsibility is with those ministers and no one else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. I now uh, point of order, Mr Bibby.
Is the member's uh, microphone on? Thank you. I want to point out, the presiding officer, members are meant to treat others with courtesy and respect. The Transport Minister has revealed a, a, an email to the Chamber this afternoon that nobody else has seen it in this Chamber. It is absolutely unacceptable that the Minister is actually treating the Parliament and members with contempt. Where is the email? We have not been sent it. No one has seen it. This is utterly unacceptable and disrespectful to the Parliament, the way this Government is behaving. I, I thank the member for his point of order. I uh, too was unaware of this development. I think it is something that will be reflected upon and uh, a response will be given later this afternoon to the member, if that is acceptable. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the open debate and I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Paul McLennan. It speeches of up to four minutes, please, and there is very little time in hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Since I was elected to this Parliament six years ago, the fragility and unreliability of Scotland's ferry network has undoubtedly been one of the most serious local issues that I have dealt with. When we last debated this issue, I spoke of the people and communities who rely, depend even, on a robust ferry service. They are at their wit's end as they continue to live with a substandard service that provides little in the way of comfort or certainty. And as others have said just 30 minutes ago, an email from CalMac says that the MV Law of the Isles is out of service for repairs, eight days suspension. It does not end. And to Alistair Allen, I say this, it's his SNP government that has presided over this chaos. Because we don't hear enough about the livelihoods of the thousands of islanders who suffer from this. What about their jobs, their lives? As Graham Simpson noted in his remarks, let's listen to the island communities. Last week, Aaron elected a Scottish Conservative councillor. Butte elected the first Scottish Conservative councillor there in some 40 years. And Sky elected a Scottish Conservative councillor for the first time ever. The fact is, people are starting to notice when it comes to ferries, who is standing up for them and who is letting them down. The problems surrounding our network have been known to the government, and yet no meaningful action has been taken. We know that the contract to build two vital ferries was handed to Ferguson Marine against the explicit advice of CMAO, a subject I will come back to. We know that ministers ignored that advice and pressed ahead anyway. We don't know why, as others have said. We know Audit Scotland's view. Their report has been much quoted, but it bears repeating. They said, significant financial and procurement risks associated with the deal and the weakness in Ferguson Marine's project governance were to be noted. The Auditor General said the failure to deliver these two ferries on time and on budget exposes a multitude of failings, a lack of transparent decision making, a lack of project oversight and no clear understanding of what significant sums of money have achieved and crucially communities still don't have the lifeline ferries they were promised years ago. Absolutely damning words from our national independent scrutiny body. And we know that all the while these ferries still remain in dock, over £150 million of a budget, severely delayed, with no realistic end in sight, and never-ending despair felt by our island communities. Can I focus briefly on some email exchanges from 2015 between Eric Ostergaard, Chair of CMAL, and Tom Doherty, Chief Executive of CMAL, about the deal with Ferguson Marine, because their advice could not be clearer. One email from Mr Ostergaard said, there is no way that the board can recommend the Scottish Government through CMAL take this level of unsecured risk on its shoulders. There is no way that the board can recommend the Scottish Government through CMAL take this level of unsecured risk on its shoulders. CMAL. The very body tasked with procuring ferries for Scotland, the very body whose reason for existence is to own, buy and sell ferries, saying in the plainest possible language, do not do this. And yet, despite all of this, despite all of these justified concerns from their in-house experts, the Scottish Government pressed ahead. And we do not know why. It stinks to high heaven, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is a scam. As a result, our local communities are suffering and will continue to suffer because of this staggering ineptitude. And while it won't fix the damage that has been done, 
the SNP government has to apologise to people who rely on these services and now tell us who is responsible for this mess and who will go as a result of this shambles. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Edward Mountain and speeches of up to four minutes. Please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thanks for the opportunity to speak in this debate this afternoon. I am aware how important ferries are to the communities they serve and what it means to the economy and general well-being of such communities. We also have to acknowledge, however, that £2 billion has been invested in service contracts, new vessels and infrastructure since 2007, and in the current five-year period, a further £580 million has been committed. The Scottish Government's commitment to publish the island's connectivity plan by the end of 2022 is, of course, welcome and I have no doubt will be discussed in this chamber. As we know, the island's connectivity plan will replace the current ferries plan, looking at aviation, ferries and fixed link, invest in more sustainable ferries and ensure 30 per cent of state-owned ferries are low emission by 2032. I have only got four minutes and a lot to go through. The island connectivity plan will be taken forward through the National Strategic Strategy and Strategic Transport Projects Review. This will enable us to consider other potential viable options connecting the islands. As I said, the Islands Connectivity Plan will replace the Ferries Plan by the end of 2022, and engagement and consultation on this will enable substantial public and community input, and that is quite right. The Scottish Government plans to explore the potential to build more fixed links to island and remote communities, and work with island communities to reduce reliance on ferries. This needs to be part of the consultation process. Investment in a ferry fleet can come with benefits for industry. The Scottish Government's intervention in 2019 saved the Ferguson Yard and its workforce. I have only got four minutes and we are stuck for time. Uh, and that does not mean uh, um, an Excuse answer. me. Uh, could Mr McLennan take a seat, please? I, I would remind members of the rule it is really up to members whether they wish to take an intervention or not. Punto. Mr McLennan. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. That, that does not mean I, didn't take, I don't take an interest in the subject, so do not be patronising. Design exactly. officer. Mr McLennan, uh, please resume your seat a second. I appreciate that uh, feelings are running high in this debate, but we have a duty of courtesy and respect right across the chamber. Please resume, Mr McLennan. I apologise. Deputy President, officer, I want to focus on, on the point about the, work, the Ferguson workforce. Let us not forget the workforce of the Ferguson Yard. That has hardly been touched on in this debate. Hundreds of families rely on the yard for their well-being and, and welfare. And let us not start to what imagine the impact on local community would have been had the yard have closed. By all means, let us scrutinise decisions, but do not forget the workforce. Progress has been made at Yard, but we need to ensure Ferguson Marine is back to being a serious contender for future vessel contracts. However, we must ensure delivery as best we can when it comes to lifeline services for our island communities. The Scottish Government remains fully committed to supporting the Ferguson Yard to support a sustainable future, including a pipeline of future work. The Scottish Government continues to work closely with the Yard to ensure that it becomes globally competitive. The decision taken to safeguard the future of Fergus Marine was the right decision. The Scottish Government has set two priorities for the yard's management to finish building the two ferries that are currently under construction and to get the yard back into shape to compete for new work. Scottish Government ministers will do all they can to ensure a strong future for Ferguson. The Scottish Government remains open to feedback regarding areas for improvement going forward and has committed to a review of the legal structures and the governance arrangements which exist between the tripartite group of Transport Scotland, Seaman and, of course, CalMac that remain fit for purpose to deliver an effective, efficient and economic ferry service. The Scottish Government is also developing a revised ferry stakeholder engagement strategy. The strategy will set out an approach to engagement on three issues, of operational, issues eh, on operational issues, strategy and policy. The Scottish Government is also pledging to consult an evolution of fares policy, including the freight plan as part of the island's connectivity plan. The Infrastructure Investment Plan for Scotland 2021-22-2026 will produce and maintain a long-term plan and investment programme for new ferries and development at ports to improve resilience, reliability, capacity and, of course, accessibility, and reduce emissions to meet the island needs of island communities. President officer, in conclusion, it has been a tough year for island communities. There's that there is no doubt. Lessons do need to be learned. Our island communities need to be fully assured. They need to be fully consulted, and we need a thriving shipbuilding industry in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I now call Edward Mountain to be followed by Katie Clark. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Mountain. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The ferries crisis is not merely a catastrophic failure. It is the biggest and most expensive scandal of this SNP government so far. Reports from the REC Committee and the Audit Scotland prove that. But huge questions remain. Why did the Scottish ministers go against the advice from their advisers and award a contract to Fergus Marine? Where did the £45 million in loans that was given to Ferguson Marine by Derek Mackay go? 
And how can the £2,500 per day paid to Tim Hare be value for money? Is anyone going to take responsibility? Does any minister want to stand up and take responsibility? Obviously not, which is why we need a full public inquiry. Now let's look at the milestone payments made to Ferguson Marine, which saw the taxpayer hand over 84% of the contract value for two ferries in return for one rusting hull and some spare parts. Initially, there were 15 of these stage payments, but when things started to go wrong at the yard, the government increased them to 18, allowing the contractor to get more DOSH earlier. Now, as a surveyor with 15 years of experience, I know that stage payments are agreed with the quantity surveyor needed to sign off each of them. It cannot possibly have happened here. Now, I've submitted freedom of information requests on each milestone payment. What checks were carried out on the house and who approved and signed off the payments? Simple enough questions. There should be a paper trail. Maybe it will turn up miraculously today. But that information should be easy to release. But this secretive government has delayed answers on every single one of my FOIs in relation to this. What are they hiding? Have they lost these papers as well? And when checking the milestone payments, they certainly didn't listen to the skilled workforce in the yard. We know for a fact from the union rep, Alex Logan, that the workers knew of the faults, but were required to press ahead with construction based on flawed design. Did the Scottish Government ever ask them? They make such noises about it. But no, no, they didn't. They just dis dished out the dosh. Unapproved bulbous bows for 801. Not fit for purpose mooring stations on 801. Cables placed up the lift shafts in the ferry 801. All triggered payments. They even signed off the payment for launching the vessel, ignoring the fact that it had fake funnels connected to pretendy engines on, with painted on windows. Now, this government went to pay all but one of the milestone payments on 801. Ridiculous, in my mind, when it's clear that it isn't even half built. Lessons weren't learnt when it came to 802 either. 13 of the 18 payments were made there, with little more than a keel being laid which was evidence when the government took over control. How could this be allowed to happen? Why did the Scottish Government agree to 18 stage payments instead of the industry standard five? Who signed that off? Perhaps the government knew at the outset there was a real problem with cash flow in Ferguson Marines. What other reasons are there for agreeing so many stage payments? I'm sure it's nothing to do with the fact that Jim McCall had a direct telephone contact with the First Minister, which is a matter of public record. Surely not, but there's no records of these telephone calls, so perhaps we'll never know. A shambles, no paperwork, no scrutiny, all of which has cost the Scotland in excess of 300 million. Now, earlier this, this afternoon, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance asked what other contracts were available. It appears she doesn't even know what's going on in her own yard. At the time the contracts awarded, there was fish farm vessel Hull 805, Callister Helen, that was being built. There was another one called Helen Rice that was on the books. There were three vessels in total because there was a gas vessel and Petro uh, The member is just about to conclude his remarks RG because Mack. the member is over time. Please conclude, Mr Mountain. Thank you. Presiding officer, the full lids let to be lifted on this dismal affair. Our islanders desperately need these long-delayed ferries and they deserve answers. This is a shambolic, scandalously organised contract which really does need a public inquiry. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I refer to my entry in the Register of Members' Interests. And I would like to address the issues of openness and transparency, and in particular as that affects the issues that were raised in the Audit Scotland report. The Scottish Government has the power to lift non-disclosure agreements, and it has been reported that at least one figure was keen to pass on evidence to the Auditor General, but was held back from passing that evidence. So could the Scottish Government today confirm that both current and former employees, and indeed any other person covered by 
a non-disclosure agreement which the Scottish Government has entered into should not be prevented from speaking out on this issue. Because it is clear that the management of this project to build hulls 801 and 802 has been shambolic, with bad and politicised decision-making, poor appointments and a culture of secrecy. Neither islanders nor the workforce were involved in the decision making and the representation that were made for smaller vessels to be built were ignored. It is vital for all of us and for the taxpayer that we learn the lessons of this procurement process. I believe that these issues of openness and transparency are indeed an issue of principle and that it will be impossible for lessons to be learnt from this fiasco unless there is access both for the public and parliament to the facts. Six years ago, the First Minister attended the ferry launch, and since then we know that the cost has reached two and a half times the vessel's original budget. We know that senior managers have been paid eye-watering sums, and we repeatedly hear about the £2 million, which we understand Tim here was paid. So it's clear that Scotland needs proper explanations and access to information and documents to enable proper scrutiny to take place. So that's what I think this debate should be about, and that's why Labour has put down the amendment to focus on those issues in the debate today. Labour is committed to Ferguson Marine. We are committed to the workforce, we are committed to shipbuilding in Scotland and to investment to rebuild that sector here. None of what has happened in this fiasco is the fault of the workforce, but of poor management and poor political decision making. None of what has happened is the fault of the islanders who rely on these lifeline services but are paying the price of the mistakes which have been made. We now need the Scottish Government to come forward to waive the non-disclosure requirements within these contracts and to come with a long-term plan, including the procurement of ferries within Scotland with an industrial strategy to rebuild our shipbuilding industry as part of a wider green agenda. Hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money have been spent and misspent. We need transparency, and we need an undertaking today from the Scottish Government that they will waive the requirements of the non-disclosure agreements so that this Parliament can discover the truth. Thank you, Ms Clark. And I now call Sue McMillan to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Up to four minutes, please, Mr McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, first of all, I'd like to thank Graham Simpson for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Also, Mr Bibby, if you're going to quote me, please quote me accurately. Uh, I did say worker in, in, when I spoke earlier on in a previous debate as compared to workforce. And also, Mr Rennie. Mr Rennie spoke about, about the yard. Mr Rennie, the yard shut in 2014. The yard went into liquidation in 2019. That tells me there was a problem with that yard for a long period of time. Clearly, the issue of procurement is crucial in any contract, and I will come back to the issue of procurement, uh, part of the motion that Mr Simpson put down uh, in a moment. The Conservative motion also uh, states, and I quote, calls uh, for the Scottish Government to say why it awarded the contract for ferries 801 and 802 to Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited against the advice of its own experts. First of all, these experts, CMAL, these are the same experts that the Conservatives, Labour and the Lib Dems have castigated and demonised for the last few years. Now that it suits them, now that it suits the Conservative narrative, they are actually trying to cosy up to CMAL. Now, I think it's quite obvious that the, no, no, I think it's quite obvious. I think it's quite obvious that, uh, that the language towards CMAL has changed since the Audit Scotland report. I generally would suggest to MSPs from any party that they should engage with CMAL to learn about their work and also their understanding of what they actually do. CMAL play an important part across this country, but also to Port Glasgow, where they are based. I can assure Mr Simpson and his Conservative colleagues that, that if the Scottish Government had sat on its hands and did nothing in 2019, the yard was closing, the jobs were gone, the vessels would have been towed elsewhere, and political parties would have been canvassing in new arc apartments for last week's council elections where a shipyard once stood. 
Is Graham Simpson seriously suggesting that the SNP Scottish Government should have sat on its hands as the Labour Lib Dem Scottish Executive did in 2005 after they awarded the fisher protection vessel to Poland? I'm sure that Mr Simpson and also, and also I'm sure Mr Simpson and also other Conservative colleagues would have been urging the Scottish Government to intervene to save the jobs. However, certainly after some of his earlier comments, uh, uh, we have only have four minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, however, if after uh, sir, Mr, M sorry, Mr Simpson's earlier comments, it's apparent that if I, I generally don't think, generally don't believe that the Conservatives actually would have stepped in. So that yard would have shut. Intervening saved the jobs and also provided an opportunity for the future. Now, progress has been made at the yard. There's still some way to go. There is still some way to go. Operational decisions, operational decisions of which vessel opportunities to pursue are for the Ferguson management team and the board of directors. Uh, there's also no doubt that getting the vessels completed, these two vessels, 801 and 802, are extremely, they have been extremely challenging. Clearly they have been. Uh, but let's be clear, these vessels must be delivered as soon as possible. And I've said that before in this chamber. Uh, there can be no ifs and no buts when it comes to lifeline services for our island communities. And the procurement process for vessels 801 and 802 was undertaken thoroughly, in good faith and following appropriate due diligence and suggestions to the contrary are incorrect. And only last month, presenting officer, only last month, MSPs from across this chamber and also the local MP attended uh, the yard. We visited the yard and also everyone had a chance to ask any question they wanted to to the new chief executive and also to the secondee from CMAL. And certainly colleagues from across the chamber did that. And it's clear the yard are making progress, but there is still some way to go, as I've stated. Uh, and I know that's certainly from the phone calls I get from the workforce when I talk to them. And on the issue of procurement, which I still come back to, if the Scottish Conservatives really do actually want to talk about procurement, look at their colleagues in Westminster. Look at the shambles that's going on in Westminster. Look at the £10.5 billion worth of pandemic-related contracts without a competitive tender process in the VIP lane. And that companies with the right political connections were ten times as likely to win these contracts. Signing officer, I will take no lessons from the Tories, whether here or from Westminster. And also, and also although Aaron has voted for a Tory, Thankfully, there are 63 fewer Tory councillors in Scotland as of last week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms McMillan. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Jenny Minto. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Burgess. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Whilst I am glad for the opportunity to champion the causes of my constituents on an issue which is so vital to island life, it concerns me that debates in this chamber have not moved the conversation on. I know that I have cross-party colleagues who feel the impact of this issue as keenly as I do, having been contacted by constituents from small business to businesses to school children who have felt the impact of ferry service disruption on their quality of life. During my recent visit to Benbecula and South Uist, almost every conversation I had on the doorstep reflected this. I strongly feel that we should use our time in this chamber to make progress, present solutions and advance the causes of our constituents. Islanders and Fergus Marine workers alike deserve far better than party political point scoring. Of course, accountability in public spending is also critical, and I welcome the robust scrutiny we have provided in our debates on this matter. I also welcome the Scottish Government's willingness to acknowledge the shortfalls of the, of the past and its commitments to learn from these. I cannot emphasise enough that the next 10 years are vital for the future of our planet and the Scottish Government must take an approach to procurement that centres environmental impact and community well-being. We must urgently seek to decarbonise our existing vessels and utilise technology like Northlink and Orkney Islands Council are doing, reducing emissions through use of an onshore electricity connector. But the problem is not just about procurement. To get our ferry services fully functioning, we need a comprehensive long-term marine infrastructure plan. This should cover ports, harbours, vessels, Scotwind and all components of Scotland's marine infrastructure. As part of this plan, we could establish three standard sizes for new vessels so that they can berth at more ports to make it easier for one ferry to substitute for another when it's offline. And we must go further to make our ferries a good green transport option for the 21st century. I only have four minutes. The significant investment into the sector must be future-proofed by making our ferries cleaner and greener to run. 
If ferry operators enjoy the certainty of longer-term contracts, then they could seek investment on the back of future ticket sales to procure their vessels without the need for substantial public investment. Fixed links could provide cost-effective long-term solutions to island communities such as Yell and Unst in Shetland, where there is widespread community support. Depopulation is one of the key defining issues for islanders, and ferry services are only one piece of the puzzle. We need to take a holistic approach. We should extend the policy of free bus travel for under 22s to ferries, bringing parity between islands and the mainland in Scotland public transport offer. We must also improve the interconnectedness between rail and ferry routes, which currently can render islands inaccessible. With ScotRail now in public ownership, thanks to the Green Deal with the Scottish Government, it paves the way for a more fully integrated public transport network, which works for all. These proposals in concert with the potential to help a reversing rural depopulation trend, revitalising our communities and making the islands more accessible for those who walk, wheel and cycle. I will finish with this thought. Whenever I speak about ferries in this chamber, committee or the, in the press, I'm always humbled by the response of my constituents. They get in touch with ideas, solutions, great initiatives, like fitting electric vehicle charge points onto ferries. From procurement through to manufacture to delivery, we all agree that Scotland needs more reliable, greener ferry service services. So I would urge my colleagues to be more like our constituents and work together on solutions for the future of our ferry services. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Burgess. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Uh, presiding officer, can you, uh, can you explain, do we have any time in hand in this debate for interventions so we can have a proper debate? Uh, I thank, I thank Mr Kerr for his contribution. Um, it, it's entirely up to members whether or not they take, entirely up to members whether or not they choose to take an intervention and uh, there is no time in hand uh, and the length of the debate of course was fixed by the Bureau, not by the Chair. Thank you. I now call uh, Jenny Minto as the last speaker in the open... Point of order, Mr. Point Simpson. Of order. In, in, in relation to the uh, announcement made by the Minister earlier about the missing email, the first, the first I have seen of it has been on Twitter. I've just seen it now. That is disrespectful to this Parliament. I, I, I thank Mr. Simpson for his point of order, as I had indicated to Mr. Bibby in his earlier point of order on this general subject. This matter is being currently reflected upon and a report will be provided later to the Chamber. Another point of order, Mr Bibby? I have now seen emails on social media, not been sent directly by the Government. It does appear that the, um, the Deputy First Minister had cleared the way, the, the way for the award. Um, so I wonder if the, 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 the Scottish Government can actually clarify um, the F Deputy First Minister's role in this, which was uh, not included in the Transport Minister's opening remarks. I thank Mr Bibby for his further contribution. Uh, as to the, the substance of the document in question, I have not seen that, so I cannot comment on that. Obviously, in terms of, in terms of uh, the substance of documents, uh, the member will have many opportunities to pursue that issue, which is a slightly separate issue from the issue that Mr Bibby first raised with the Chair a wee while ago. Thank you. Point of order, Mr Kirk. Uh, presiding officer, is it so not in the judgment of the presiding officer of the Chair of this Parliament that it is the height of disrespect to introduce that document in the way it's been introduced? Surely that is, an, is bordering on contempt of Parliament to treat us this way. Uh, it's, it's a huge disrespect and surely the presiding officer would have a view on that. I thank Mr Kerr for his point of order, as I have already indicated to both Mr Bibby in his first point of order, to Mr Simpson in his point of order, and now to Mr Kerr in his point of order. The matter is currently being actively reflected upon, and uh, a response will be provided later on this afternoon. And I hope that I can move on to the last speaker in the open debate, because obviously time is short, the time set by the Bureau for this debate, and I would like to hear the full speaking time from the remaining speakers. Ms Minto, uh, up to four minutes, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as I've said before, I am the MSP with the highest number of ferry routes in my constituency and live on an island. I understand the shortcomings of the service and therefore have a bigger stake in its improvements than most sitting in this chamber. As others have said, the Scottish Government has committed £580 million to fund new ferries and port investment in this parliamentary session. And this has included uh, the introduction of the MV Loch Frisa being purchased to serve the island of Mull, a welcome addition to the route helping the island to have a year-round two-boat service, as well as releasing the Karusk to support other routes. And two new ferries for Isla have been ordered, which bring an almost 40 per cent increase in vehicle and freight capacity, reduction in emissions and improve the resilience of the wider fleet. I would suggest that there is a clear path, plan. The new Mull boat, the small vessel replacement programme and new vessels for the Danoon, Gourick and Kilcreggan triangle. I know that the Scottish Government recognises that ferries are an essential part of Scotland's transport network and the quality of our ferry services impacts on all of us. Engagement and consultation will enable substantial public and community input. I know that my constituents are willing to get involved as this is their lifeline service and I commend my constituents who want to engage. For example, the Isla Ferry Group completed sterling work informing Transport Scotland, Calmac and CMAL on the projected ferry demand of the whisky industry, farming and tourism to inform the design of the new ferries as well as on timetable changes. Eleven days I convened a meeting on Jura linking the Community Council and Development Trust with Transport Scotland, Calmac, Park Island Butte Council and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. As an island off an island, Jura is not unique in this, but it does give them a slightly more complicated approach to travel. By bringing these key stakeholders into the same room as the Jura folk, we were able to discuss the constraints and issues of their transport services and explore solutions. There are concerns around crew staffing on the Jura route. It is good that these connections have been strengthened here to look into resolutions to ensure this lifeline service is fit for purpose. The Scottish Government provides funding for local authority ferries like the Jura Ferry, and I am therefore pleased that the Transport Minister has committed to meet with local authority partners on this. And later this month, I am hosting a public meeting with Calmac on Mull to ensure islanders have their say on how the ferry situation impacts on their lives. The following day, Calmac and I will meet with the Mull and Iona Ferry Committee to progress matters raised. And tonight, as that has been mentioned before, Calmac management will be in Parliament to speak to MSPs, and I hope to see all speakers and perhaps everybody that is in the chamber here in, uh, taking part in this debate there. My constituents in Argyll and Butte are rightly concerned about ferries, but they are looking forward with the SNP. Engaging with stakeholders, seeking solutions, being what islanders are, resilient. The SNP in Argyll and Butte advanced in last week's local government election, increasing its vote share and number of councillors. Meanwhile, the Tory vote share reduced. And in every single seat that has a ferry service, the Tory vote went down. So, in the spirit of cross-party cooperation, I will let the Scottish Tories into a secret. The main problem that very many of in my constituency, it is true, the main problem that very many of my constituents face, as do people in every corner of Scotland, is the cost of living crisis, the cost of feeding their family and paying their heating bills. Perhaps instead of grandstanding over ferries, Conservative members here might like instead to have words with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Unless Westminster does something radical to help the ordinary people of Scotland, I am standing up for my constituents. No the member is about to conclude. Thank you. Unless Westminster does something radical to help the ordinary people of Scotland and elsewhere in the British Isles, the cost of living crisis will drag on for longer and with far, far greater consequences than the current problems with ferries, which the Scottish Government and the Transport Minister are focused on sorting. Thank you, Ms Minto. We will now move to closing speeches, and I call on Rhoda Grant to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Ms Grant is joining us remotely. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The crux of this debate is, the dis is that disastrous deci decisions were made costing the Scottish people hundreds of millions of pounds, cost to our island communities is immeasurable. We suspect these decisions were made for political reasons, to further the SNP's ambitions rather than to serve our island communities and Scotland's industry. 
It seems convenient that the Scottish Government have found proof that they can pin the blame on Derek Mackay, who appears to have made that decision when on holiday without reference to any of his colleagues. It beggars belief. Willie Rennie said that the email raises more questions than answers. Given the Scottish Government's secrecy, it is convenient that this email came to hand just before this debate. At the cursory glance from so this social media, the email states, just finished my call with the DFM. He now understands the background and that Mr Mackay has cleared, has cleared the proposal. So the way is clear to award. It seems like the Deputy First Minister actually signed off this award. Frankly, it adds to the stink surrounding this fiasco. The Minister wants us to move on. Unfortunately, our island communities cannot move on, or indeed, many cannot move at all. These ferries are not in operation. The Scottish Government appears unable to do anything to help. Alistair Allen and Donald Cameron pointed out in the debate the breakdown of the Lord of the Isles, yet there is no capacity in the fleet to allow for that repair without disruption. It's simply not good enough. We still have no answer to as to how they will make up the shortfall of capacity to the US when Uig Harbour is being adapted to fit the new ferry if it ever arrives. This is now urgently required, and I hope the Minister will intervene to ensure that capacity is retained throughout this period. We need openness and transparency as to what went wrong. Neil Bibby said that past employees of Ferguson need to be released from their non-disclosure agreements so that we can find out what happened, both in the letting of the contract and what happened thereafter as well. My colleagues Neil Bibby and Katie Clark said this should not just be released to Audit Scotland, but to the Parliament and indeed to the public as well. This is their money, their ferries, and they deserve to know what went wrong. The Scottish Government always seek to shift the blame to Ferguson's, to Calmac, to Seamal, and now to Derek Mackay. However, the blame sits squarely with them. They need to make good their mismanagement and stop letting our island communities down. They have also let Ferguson's down. Instead of protecting jobs, they have put them at risk and they are now procuring ferries for themselves in Turkey. My heart goes out to those who work in Ferguson's. If the Scottish Government had nothing to hide, they would release the workers from the gagging clauses so we can see what went wrong and where. Failure to do so means that mistakes will continue to be made, a point made by Katie Clark in debate. This is not a, pub, a failure of the public sector to provide lifeline services. This is a failure of government. The public sector should run lifeline services. These services should not be run for the profit of multinationals. They must be run for the communities dependent upon them. Therefore, we need full disclosure. Voting for Labour's amendment tonight will provide that full disclosure. Thank you, Ms Grant. And I now call on Ivan McKee. Uh, at point of order, Graeme Simpson. Presiding officer, I apologise for making another point of order. However, however, um, the new, new news has leaked out um, during the course of this debate, disgracefully, on social media. We now know that John Swinney was involved in the decision. We know that John Swinney was involved in the decision to award the contract to Ferguson's. Should it not be that John Swinney, yeah. who, was, uh, who was involved, should be making a statement to this chamber? Uh, I, I, thank, I thank Mr Simpson for his contribution. Uh, the issue that was raised was the issue about the uh, appearance of the document without any awareness on the part of the chamber, and including the chair, uh, uh, in terms of the same. Uh, as to the substance of government documents, that is not a matter for the Chair, as the Member well knows, uh, and it is uh, a matter for uh, the Government, uh, including the Bureau, in terms of discussing any statements that may be appropriate in the Chamber, and that is not a matter for the Chair, I think, as the Member knows. And I would now like to call Ivan McKee uh, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government up to five minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and um, I'm uh, happy to be closing this debate, which has been a, an interesting debate. Um, 
Uh, many members have focused rightly on the importance of ferries to island communities, those lifeline services that are so important. Jenny Minto um, talked through the work that is ongoing by the Scottish Government as part of that £580 uh, million pound investment to support the expansion of the ferry fleet and the progress that has been made, not as fast as we like, but the progress that has been made. And that, of course, on top of the £2 billion pounds that has been invested by this Government since 2007 to support the ferry services across Scotland. And that is the important thing that matters for those island communities. The Scottish Government, as has been made clear in questions and debates in this, in, in this chamber on many occasions, is absolutely committed to delivering 801 and 802 from Ferguson's. But we also recognise uh, from the Audit Scotland report the challenges that are faced. Um, the fact that the Audit Scotland report says that the uh, turnaround of the FMPG is extremely challenging and that uh, FMPG has implemented some significant operational improvements that have been required at the shipyard in, uh, in recent months. Those challenges are indeed great. The initial report on the state of the yard, December 2019, uh, when, when the Scottish uh, Government rescued the yard, uh, set out the scale and depth of the business turnaround required to put Ferguson's Marine onto a stable footing. COVID, as we know, have slowed the turnaround efforts. The, the yard has twice had to shut down due to COVID and worked at reduced capacity for many months as a result of the necessary distancing uh, requirements. But despite that huge task, progress has been made. The new permanent chief uh, executive has been in post since February. Um, I speak with him regularly. Cabinet Secretary speaks with him uh, very regularly. He brings a fresh vision and a new approach in creating a more collaborative culture, working much more closely with CMAL. But let me be very clear uh, with Parliament. This government expects the yard as a priority to complete those vessels successfully and at the fastest, most achievable pace, expects the Yard to turn around its operations so it's competitive, productive and efficient and expects the Yard to win and secure a further pipeline of work on the basis of its operations. Give way to whoever was first. Uh, Liam, Liam Kerr. The, on the point of the new Chief Executive, the former turnaround director was paid £2,500 plus per day while in post, which the First Minister said was market rate. You're paying the new chief executive, who you lauded, Minister, uh, between £700 and £1,000 per day. Is he three to four times less effective? Minister. The member knows how turnaround works. You bring in somebody for that initial period of time to do one job, and you bring somebody else in to do the permanent job following on from that. Uh, if, he'd, uh, if he's worked in turnaround, as I have, then he would understand that is how these operations, uh, these operational aspects uh, work. I want to move on in the brief time I have available um, to talk about uh, the, uh, the other issues. Um, the issue of transparency, we've heard much about that today and the, the missing document. We've made very clear in my answer to topical questions, other members and, and, and ministers, including the First Minister, made it very clear that in good faith we uh, sought that document, looked for it. It was clear from the other documents that, are, that already have been published, well, the 200. And I want to make some progress. I've only got two minutes left. It was very, from, from that, uh, that, that was very clear that the decision-making process had been, uh, had been followed correctly. And it was also clear now from that, that document that has uh, ha, has been found uh, just today, brought to attention of ministers, um, that uh, the process was followed, um, and, and members can see that, see that for themselves from the document. In regard to the process of that document, I think it's right and proper that my colleague, uh, Minister for Transport, has brought that document at the earliest possible opportunity to this chamber to make members uh, aware and to publish that on the Scottish Government website um, to make members absolutely aware of this. So I think uh, opposition members are chasing off and uh, uh, wild goose chases here that they're conspiracy theories. The important point is the process has been followed, the document is public, but what is important is that we work very hard, as I have said we are, with the Yard to deliver those ferries. But what is also important, and I want to reflect on uh, what Stuart McMillan, his contribution, which was hugely significant, uh, and, uh, and, and Willie Rennie's contribution, which was hugely significant, but for other uh, 180 degree opposite reasons. The Yard only uh, uh, is still open because of the interventions taken by the Scottish Government. Uh, Graham Simpson, uh, if unable to answer the question what this other mythical work was. The reality is that without those orders being placed by the Yard, the Yard, as Stuart McMillan rightly said, would not be here today. And that is on the back of the other industrial interventions that this Government has taken to save uh, the Loch Arbor aluminium smelter, to save the, the steelworks at, uh, at DL, um, and, and on top of the work that we've done to save the jobs at Inverclyde. Because what matters to the communities, the workers, the people of Scotland, what matters to the communities, the workers and the people of Scotland is that those, uh, those businesses stay open, they stay producing, and they stay as 
part of Scotland's industrial landscape. That's what this government is committed to. That's what we've delivered on all of those instances. Uh, and whether any can talk about uh, what if, buts and maybes, the reality is if he'd been in government, which is hugely unlikely, then those, th those facilities would all be closed. We're in government and that's why they're still open, because we're committed to that industrial base across Scotland. And that's what matters at the end of the day, not uh, th th this uh, conspiracy theories that come up from the opposition bench. I've got time. I'll take uh, up, uh, an, an intervention uh, Minister, from, uh, you're just about to conclude. Thank you. Sorry. Well, well, I'm sure we'll have another opportunity to debate this very important point uh, in, the, in the not too distant uh, future Minister, as we continue to articulate our commitment to Scotland's industrial base and saving those jobs as we've done Thank hundreds you, of jobs Thank you. in our climate. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, I now call Liam Kerr to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives up to six minutes. Before that, before I have a point of order from Edward Mountain. Uh, presiding officer, I, I cannot let that comment pass from the minister that they've saved the aluminium smelter at Loch Arbor. They've signed a deal without doing proper due diligence on the infrastructure there, which M doesn't Mr. Mountain, save a plant. Mr. Mountain, that, that is, is not a not point of order. True, that so is not a matter. Mr. Mountain, that is not a matter for the chair. That is not a point of order. I call Liam Kerr to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to six minutes, please, Mr. Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. Graham Simpson opened this debate saying that inexplicably. He wasn't allowed to call it a ferry's fiasco. But we have heard from member after member this afternoon that that is exactly what this is. It is not simply the facts of the matter that we've heard about. The budget rocketing from 97 million to 250, of taxpayers' money and maybe up to 400 million. The milestone payments made to Ferguson Marine, which saw the taxpayer hand over 84% of the contract value without an actual ship being completed. Mm -hmm. The fact that workers knew of the faults but were apparently required to press ahead with a construction based on flawed designs. Designs which we learned recently may not even have been finalised. The nearly a thousand electrical cable coils which are too short. In two seconds Mr McMillan. And apparently all of this may have even broken EU state aid rules. Mr McMillan. Stuart McMillan. Thank Liam Kerr for taking intervention. Just on the point regarding the workers. Uh, and the workers uh, being forced to go and, and undertake work. Who actually were their managers at that point? Uh, were those managers actually uh, from the previous ownership? Liam Kerr. I go back to the point that was made in response to an intervention earlier. The responsibility for this fiasco lies firmly at the feet of this government and nobody else, Mr Macmillan, because it is not simply those facts which make this a fiasco. We have heard powerful testimony this afternoon around the impact on islanders who can't get to hospital, can't get to work, can't get deliveries, can't see family and friends and can't even get to school. And we've heard about the SNP's attitude to this. The minister said, we've got to lift the tone. Oh, ain't that the truth, minister? Whether it be Nicola Sturgeon responding, oh, for goodness sake, when asked to apologise to those islanders. Whether it be Stuart Hosey MP denying that money has been wasted, even though it's 150 million over budget, and describing the vessels as being a little late. Whether it be the minister herself in her own anodyne amendment describing this fiasco as regrettable, and that debating this is Groundhog Day or simply Jenny Minto saying that using our debating time for this is grandstanding. But it is not only that which makes this a fiasco, because what we've heard is exactly what this says about this government's attitude to governance and security. We heard the minister saying there are huge numbers of documents in the public domain, as if that exonerates them, that somehow releasing volume means we won't notice that the key document is still missing. Well, we did notice, but perhaps more importantly, Audit Scotland noticed and reported there is insufficient documentary evidence as to why the SNP accepted the risks and approved the contract award. Well, what we do know is that in 2015, Ferguson Marine confirmed it was unable to provide CMAL with a full refund guarantee, one of the mandatory requirements of the contract. We know CMAL notified Transport Scotland of its concerns, who in turn notified ministers, who accepted the risks and were content to approve the contract award. Why? We just don't know, because the crucial document saying why doesn't exist, either because it wasn't recorded, potentially in breach of the Public Finance and Accountability Act, or it has been misplaced. Lord McConnell summed it up, 
someone in the SNP government has broken the law, either deliberately or through incompetence, which is presumably why Jim Sillis has reported this. He said, uh, the, some, some would say, a corrupt government to the police for the crime of misconduct in public office. But it's what it says about wider governance and transparency, because we don't yet know who actually greenlighted it. Sturgeon points at Mackay, then Yusuf points at Brown, then McCall points back at Sturgeon and says it was done for political gain. Today, the minister produces a one-line email found three hours before this debate. What a coincidence, which names Mackay, but actually brings in John Swinney. And then, I really don't have time, Edward, I'm afraid. But then... But then there's no question in my mind, says Jim McCall, that the decision to overrule Seamal's advice was made by the First Minister along with Derek Mackay. But we know this is a government, government that prefers the shade of secrecy to the sunlight of scrutiny. Yeah. Leaving aside Willie Rennie's points that a contract of this size apparently is signed off on a one-line email, the Project Neptune report remains unpublished, despite promises to do so. Edward Mountain struggles to FOI. Why ministers went against advice from their own advisers? Where the £45 million in loans given to Ferguson Marine by Derek Mackay went? And who approved the milestone payments? And of course, the FOIs about the Scottish Government's Loch Arbour smelter deal were, that the minister brought up were rejected until the FT engaged in a two-year battle to get them to reveal the £600 million taxpayer-funded guarantee. Signing off, sir, this is hugely serious, as what this debate has shown is a government that has failed to deliver yet again, that thinks this fiasco is merely regrettable and has a track record of secrecy, spin and perhaps shredding. And I note the words of Lord Folkes this week when he said, democracy depends on governments being transparent, accountable and honest. So if FOIs are refused, key papers lost or destroyed, parliamentary questions unanswered, and ministers lie, democracy is in danger. Presiding officer, this debate has levelled all of these charges against this Scottish Government. As the Scottish Conservative motion craves, let the shroud of secrecy be swept aside by the light of a public inquiry, and the truth be revealed. Thank you, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Mr Kerr. As, as indicated earlier, uh, I promise to return to the points of order uh, raised about the email, that being, uh, I think, the first point of order from Mr Bibby, the first point of order from Mr Simpson, and I believe the second point of order from Mr Kerr. And what I would say is the following, that further to the, uh, those points of order about the email that the Minister referred to in her opening speech in today's debate, the Minister for Transport told the Chamber that officials informed ministers shortly before noon today that an email regarding decisions on ferry procurement had been found. The Minister also indicated that this email and other documentation had been published by the Scottish Government on its website. Under the terms of the guidance on announcements, it is open to the Government to use the opportunity of opening speeches in parliamentary debates to make announcements. However, the guidance also states that where an announcement relates to a publication or release of a document, it would be helpful for copies to be made available to the non-government parties well in advance so as to inform the debate. In this instance, it is clear that advance notice would indeed have been helpful to inform members' contributions to this debate. Hence, I would encourage the Government to reflect on whether its approach to providing non-government parties with this information by speech rather than in advance was the most appropriate decision. Thank you. That concludes my response. Uh, and that concludes the debate on ferry problems. And it is now time to move on to the next item of business, before which there will be a very short pause to allow change of front bench teams. Thank you.